Welcome to Creekside Chats with successful multifamily real estate investors. Dr. Allen chats with successful investors exploring their journey from setback to triumph. Through this window, we glimpse the truths that inspire our guests to invest abundantly and flourish in all areas of life. And now your host, Dr. Allen. Welcome to Creekside Chats with successful multifamily real estate investors, where we delve deep into the lives of our successful guests to learn the secrets of thriving to flourish abundantly in all areas of life. Today's guest specializes in the retail space with vertical model that provides flexibility to serve multiple customer segments. He acquired and developed 110 retailers within the first year of operations. He later moved on to acquisitions and asset management vice president for Vision Properties, where he was directly involved with sourcing, negotiation, and management of the acquisition of $594 million of Class A office assets. Welcome, Anthony Scandariato. Robert Frost uh, penned these famous words several years ago, two roads diverged in the road and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. Tell us about a major fork in your road that has made all the difference in your life. Oh man. So that Robert Frost quote is an excellent quote. Um, I think what makes a major difference in my life and from what I've seen from other people who I work with and I know very closely is that life's about taking risks. So you talk about the road, least traveled. Um, taking a risk, a leap of faith is the least traveled road in general. And mm -hmm. most people just want to, in, in my case, it was uh, graduate from college, get a nice job, buy a house, get married. Sounds great. That's what was been implemented in the minds of Many, many people from day one, you can still do those things because that's part of the American dream. Um, but for me, I would say the ability to take a risk and we talk about real estate on this show to invest in real estate at a very young age and build up my cash flow streams of income um, to a point where I would be comfortable when I'm ready to, to take that step, um, that next step, uh, you know, in, in my life. Um, and, you know, after I, you gave a great summary of my bio, after um, working for that company, you mentioned Vision Properties, uh, for me, it was taking the risk and going out on my own and starting a company called Red Knight Properties now, which is, um, you know, a multifamily and mixed use real estate investment firm. So I was able to do that, and um, the risk was well worth it so far. So I hope that answers your question, Alan. Well, I'm glad to hear the, the risk has been well worth it thus far. But of course, jumping into it, like any risk, you don't really know what the outcome is going to be. What were some of the uh, psychological and emotional challenges that you were facing and that you had to conquer and overcome uh, in order yeah. to make that leap? Yeah, um, it's more of the psychological, well, it's, it's two things. So it's psychological and also when, you know, you're working in a nine to five job, you're obviously getting a salary, right? You're getting paid Correct. every month or every two weeks, whatever it is. Um, and and you're, that's, that's your source of income. That's, you know, how you live. Mm -hmm. um, I guess overcoming that challenge for me was to invest in real estate while I was still working to, and to some extent replace that income so I can go out and kind of pursue my dreams, which is what I'm doing right now. So that was a big challenge for me to step out of the mindset of, okay, you know, money's coming in from the job, which is great, but am I really happy? Am I really fulfilled in life? Is this really the path I want to go down? Um, kind of that mental shift from, being able to let go is, is, a, is a struggle um, when, when you are, you know, you want to pursue another endeavor, whether that's, you know, starting a company of your own or a philanthropic endeavor um, or anything else that requires you to kind of focus your attention on the greater goal of your, your personal life and still uh, being able to uh, financially get to where you want to be. So I think that was a challenge, uh, but something that I was able to overcome. 
Well, it sounds like you you had you had a cushion there, uh, which that helped a bit because you you had said that you had replaced uh, your income uh, via your investments. Uh, but of course, that cushion, uh, there's always a possibility that that cushion is going to evaporate uh, pretty quickly. Uh, it's not at all uncommon for new ventures to cost two to three times more than what we anticipate. So there was still, uh, even with that cushion there, there was that, uh, that fear and that risk factor there. Sure. Uh, what gave you the courage to take that leap? Um, I guess going back to what we were talking about before a little bit, um, making small baby steps while I was still in, in that environment to get into real estate investing and build up that income stream. Um, I think that if I didn't do that, I, I would not be comfortable with pursuing my company now, Red Knight, full time at all. Um, and I think what made me really comfortable was a few projects that I was planning to launch when I launched my new company actually ended up closing um, in the last month of my, my um, nine to five job. So I was able to close on a project and then have a couple of other projects already kind of lined up for mm -hmm. when I did take the, the leap. So that was, that was, uh, I was able to get around that psychological. Um, and like you said, yes, that sometimes the ventures, the money can run out. Um, is you just have to be really smart about it and plan um, and, and make sure all your ducks are in a row. Well, take us back to, uh, to your childhood and think about um, a memorable experience from your childhood that as you look back on it, you would consider it to be uh, one of the major formative experiences uh, of your childhood. Sure. Um, so childhood meaning what age group? Oh, <laughs> uh, that could be really anywhere from, uh, one to 40. So uh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> okay. So whatever works for you there. Yeah. Um, I guess it would be most likely it would be age 14 to 16, 14, mm -hmm. maybe 14 to 17, um, which would be, um, I was actually uh, diagnosed very, very early on, and a lot of other individuals in the country were being diagnosed with, uh, you know, ADD and ADHD mm -hmm. right. at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, this was back in what, the early 2000s at mm -hmm. this point. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was, it was coming out more and more, and I, I had a pretty severe case of ADHD and um, was basically failing out of... Um, you know, middle school and, you know, the early, you know, freshman years in high schools, because I, I just didn't, didn't really have a care in the world. And I was too focused on other things, which um, it did, didn't Actually, really. No focus. To... That's what ADHD is. There's no focus. <laughs> so, no focus. Yeah. No focus. Exactly. So um, I actually got sent to um, somewhat of a boarding school um, mm. and started that early high school career and um, was, was able to turn around there um, a couple of years into the boarding school and was sent back to my um, regular high school and kind of adjusted from there and, and um, you know, got to a point where I just realized I couldn't, you know, uh, slack off anymore if I'm gonna, you know, uh, improve in, in my life. And it was, it was more than just the ADHD. It was, like you said, there's, there's no focus. That was a huge part of it. Um, but, uh, there was, there was something else going on as well. So maybe it was just a young right. age, but that was a huge turning point to kind of get to that boarding school and, and see what other, um, people at, at that school was experiencing. And I thought, wow, actually that's not so bad compared to what I, what I have. Um, I really got to turn my, my, my life around. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was able to do that, went back to, like I said, the regular high school and then, um, you know, was able to go to a community college for a couple of years and then get into Cornell, which you mentioned, uh, which is a, you know, obviously an Ivy league school. Um, and I just worked my butt off um, at the community college, got involved in pretty much every activity you can think of and in a leadership capacity and uh, you know, started a couple of organizations and just really turned my life around. So that was a huge turning point. Um, that whole, like, I would say, uh, you know, 
started out 14 years old till age 21 or so. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, you sharing that. Um, just uh, looking at you now, you know, it's not something I would have ever guessed that you had actually uh, gone through. Uh, can you think back to uh, to those times? You know, actually being diagnosed with ADHD at the age of fourteen—that's really kind of late. Um, really? And if if it had happened earlier in your life, it uh, you may have gotten. Uh, an earlier start and off to an earlier start there and not had to go through many of the things you had to go through. Sure. But uh, thinking back to that time, you said that really the transitional uh, aspect came when you actually entered uh, the, the boarding school. Can you give us, if it's not too personal, can you give us some specifics as to what it was within you or what it was within the environment that actually helped you to, uh, to take that, responsibility to actually take that turn in your life? Sure. Um, so, you know, my, my upbringing was essentially, I would say, upper middle class to begin with. And when I went to the boarding school, I was exposed to, in a good way, a very diverse um, group of people from many different backgrounds, many different socioeconomic and just regular economic um, uh, backgrounds. So I think when I was exposed to that and realized I didn't have it so bad and to stop feeling sorry for myself and stop slacking off and mm. how I was able to, um, you know, I guess realize that there was a lot more potential in me than compared, you know, I wouldn't want to compare, but just looking at the environment that I was in and just, I guess, realizing that there are other people out there that have it a lot worse off than, than I do. And I'm grateful for that. I'm thankful for that. Um, and I, and then, you know, I, I try to help other people who are struggling that are in that age group now um, on the side to some extent. But um, I think, I think that was, that was it. It was just the realization of um, at a younger, younger age, not, not that young, but at a younger age um, realizing that I didn't have it so bad and, I, I can really turn my life around. Hmm. Were there, uh, was this, were these insights that you just really basically came to just because of being in that environment or were there uh, teachers, mentors, uh, fellow students that, uh, that helped with that process? Um, I think it was a combination of both. I would say it was definitely, interestingly enough, more of, the the environment that I was in, I think it was definitely way different than what I was used to. It was a shock. Mm. Um, and there was obviously, you know, the teachers and staff that were running the school um, knew how to deal with, you know, um, uh, teenagers, essentially, <laughs> um, that, you know, were, were suffering from many different types of disorders or um, whether it's behavioral or, um, you know, uh, What's that word I'm looking for? Neurological. Um, so they had some pretty good experience, but yeah, there was a few really good ones that stand out to me. Um, but it, it was it was more of you know that being in that environment and that realization. If you're just tuning into our program today, my guest is Anthony uh, Scandariato. Uh, and he has been sharing some very interesting things about his uh, life experience. Well, Anthony, you certainly did make a good uh, turnaround. If I remember correctly from, um, I think it was uh, uh, Whitney Sewell's podcast, I believe that you, not only did you graduate from uh, Cornell University, but I believe you graduated with honors, did you not? I did, yep. Yeah. Yep. So a big turnaround from um, from a a failing student uh, in middle school to uh, an honor student from uh, an Ivy League, top Ivy League uh, university. Um, so in terms of looking at your life now, Anthony, um, I, I mean, ADHD is, is, is really a, a childhood adolescent uh, issue by and large, but actually in actuality, uh, you never leave the condition behind. It just becomes easier to deal with as an adult. And of course, one of the, the major issues with ADHD is 
uh, that inability to focus. So how is it that you have come to learn to be able to focus to the degree that you can actually run, uh, uh, run your business and keep that focus and stay on track? Sure. Um, I guess it was, it it all goes back to that, you know, boarding school environment um, where I was able to learn multiple methods of keeping focused and staying still (laughs) and, uh, you know, really having my eye on the prize. Um, It it all kind of stems back to that. Um, I also, in terms of how to deal with the ADHD, and when you're running a business, there's a lot of things going on, which no kidding, you know, yes. <laughs> a, lot, a million things, which Absolutely. for someone with ADHD is that, you know, it could be a good thing. <laughs> you <laughs> could kind of, you could, you know, yeah, I got this going on, I got that, I got that and that. And you're, you know, but and the ability to organize it is obviously key at the end Excellent. of the day. Right. Um, so I've been, you know, learning how to deal with that. And, you know, through my experience that when I went away to college at, you know, at, at Cornell was kind of, um, I guess in a little bit, not of a shock, but definitely a different um, type of environment to be in where a lot, most, mostly everybody there is very studious to begin with. And, um, you know, they have their own methods to, to study and to, and to learn, but everybody has their own. So I was able to adopt some of those as well. And, um, you know, I also, you know, to kind of get out the ADHD too, I, I play music. So I play piano, I play mm-hmm. guitar. So I, I know a lot of other people who are diagnosed with this um, get, get it out through music as well. Um, so, you know, that's, that's essentially that. And, um, you know, like I said, business is, there's always something going on. I, you'd probably look at me like I'm crazy when I show you my agenda for today. I mean, it's like two pages long. Um, so it could be a good thing and a blessing in disguise, but you just have to, you have to funnel it in the right way. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's, that's the key, I think, is learning how to, to funnel it there. And it looks like you're right on track to do that and certainly doing a good job of that. We're, yeah. uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. There are so many other things I would like to discuss with you. Sure. Uh, you have to have you back on the show to continue this conversation. Sure. Uh, uh, so my guest today is Anthony uh, Scandariato. And Anthony, if you would please tell the folks how it is that they can get in touch with you. And before sure. you, uh, uh, well, I have one last question after you tell the folks where, uh, where to get in touch with you. Sure. So uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me, they can actually, I would recommend, um, so like I was telling Alan before, we buy apartment buildings and retail buildings. Uh, we have like a special report, how to leave your nine to five and be financially free. You can actually download that on our website, rednightproperties.com. It pops right up and type in your email and your name and you'll get an email to you. Um, so you can find me at our website there and then um, follow me on LinkedIn too. You can actually schedule a call with me on LinkedIn if you want to reach out to me. And uh, we have the other social media platforms as, as well, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just type in my name or Red Knight Properties and you'll find us. Very good, Anthony. My last question, which I ask all of my guests is, when you come to the end of life's journey, uh, how do you want your epitaph to read? Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, what was that last part again, Alan? How, I... how, how do you want your epitaph to read? Oh, God. <laughs> I should have read the questions before. <laughs> um, that's a tough one. Um, I just always want to be remembered for, I guess, helping people, uh, whether that's financially or personally, um, just always, just being remembered for always wanting to help others in their life, no matter what it was. Sounds like a man with a good heart. I try. Thank, thank you, Anthony, for being on the program. Uh, it's been a pleasure and I look forward to, uh, to future conversations. Sure, Alan. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to Creekside Chats with successful multifamily real estate investors brought to you by Steed Talker Capital. 
Steed Talker Capital works with both new and established investors nationwide, creating opportunities to flourish in all areas of life. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steed Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steed Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures great and small flourish abundantly. For resources to enhance your well-being through multifamily real estate investment, connect with us online at capital.steedtalker.com.